seriously, something good is already happening, and I just think it's building, building, building. You wait till we read the psalm that we're going to read today. So exciting. It's going to take us from there to there, because it's a song of ascent. It's a great song. I'm lost already. So excited. Let's pray. Father, thank you that Jesus is the living word. Lord, thank you that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Father, today we ask for daily bread, not just, not just the, the bread that we get out of a packet, but the bread that comes from heaven. Lord, daily bread to our heart, living bread to our heart. Father, let not our hearts uh, resist it or, or respond and let it go, give up on it too quickly father or or uh lord resist it through distraction but let our heart be good soil to receive it father so that it brings forth fruit in our life we ask you in jesus name amen would you like to give the team a very warm hand as you take a seat today's the second week in our series on the songs of ascent which covers um Psalms 120 to 134. Uh, they're called songs because they were sung. I know, it's a really deep revelation, right? Uh, it'll get better. Um, they're called songs of ascent because pilgrims sang them as they took the uphill journey to Jerusalem uh, three times a year for their worship festivals. So the songs give us a metaphor of the Christian life that, you know, it's being referred to the Christian life is a pilgrimage and uh, as the songs of ascent depict our life is a is a forward moving life that's lived upward towards God it's forward moving living upward so as we journey upward uh, toward God we grow that's God's intention for our life so we grow from faith to faith the things that caused us to doubt early on shouldn't always cause cause us to doubt the things that maybe we think seem impossible shouldn't always seem impossible to us because faith believes and faith can move mountains, but we grow in that. We grow from grace to grace. So whereas, you know, we can be a little judgmental, a little critical, as we journey, we should be coming less and less like that and more and more like Jesus who is, who, who is you know, full of grace and truth. We should be growing from joy to joy. So, you know, what robbed us of joy in the early days shouldn't rob us of joy as we journey. We should be able to maintain our joy a whole lot better as we get to know Jesus better than maybe we did at the beginning. You know, uh, uh, we grow from strength to strength. So what knocked us over in the early days of our Christian life shouldn't be knocking us over for the whole of our life because we grow in our, in our pilgrimage. And this morning I want to... I want to take us to Psalm 124, and if you have your little Songs of Ascent journal, Life Group resource, it's so cool, isn't it? Uh, we were at Life Group yesterday morning, and I was chatting to a good friend and asking him if he found this helpful, and uh, he, he thought it was okay. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is, you just make this work. There was a great devotion in yesterday's, really good devotion if you read it. I, I, that's my name there. That's... There's a good devotion. And, uh, but today there's, uh, there's a place to take Sunday sermon notes. So if you want to, write on your page Psalm 124 and give it the title, The Fight is Real. Got you excited already. Psalm 124. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side... When people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger fled against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the foulest snare. I like the old King James that says, my soul has escaped, you know. Our soul, we have escaped, my soul, my life has escaped like a bird 
from the trap that was set for me. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I love this particular song for one reason. It's a victory song. I got to preach Psalm 120 last week and that's a country and western song. You lose everything in that song. It's a terrible song. You know, uh, so, <laughs> Psalm 121 got a bit better. It was a song of assurance. He began to answer his difficulties and fears with the revelation of Jesus. That's a good thing. I didn't touch Psalm 122, but I, I've skipped that Psalm 123 and was straight into this one. And I love it for this reason. It's a victory song. It's a victory song. Uh, if the Lord had not been on our side, let the people of God say... If the Lord had not been on our side, I don't know about you, but I don't want to think about what life would be like if the Lord was not on our side. I don't know what life would, would look like. God is for us. Praise God. However, Paul asks a question in Romans 8.31. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And because he asks who can be against us, we shouldn't think that no one is. We shouldn't think that no one is against us. Psalm 124 is a victory song. But to have a victory, there has to be two other components, right? There needs to be an enemy, and there needs to be a fight. There needs to be an enemy, and there needs to be a fight to have a victory, and we have both. We have an enemy, and we were born into a conflict. The Christian life is not a life that's, that's lived out on, a, on an ocean cruiser in, in six-star luxury. You get born onto the battlefield. You're born into a conflict. Uh, every Christian has to face personal conflict. John says if, in 1 John 2, if you're to grow from the stage of maturity where you're just a new babe in Christ to something more than that, you're going to have to learn to overcome the evil one. You're going to have to fight some personal battles. You're going to have to get the word. You, you can't be milk fed for the rest of your life. You're going to have to get the word of God in your life so that you can be strong and overcome the battles that you will face. Overcome the challenges that you, that you will face. Our struggle, we're born into conflict, but our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Whenever we take the battle human, we're fighting the wrong way. We're not meant to fight hu hu human. We're not meant to fight humanity. It's not where the, when, when husbands and wives face each other and fight off, they're fighting the wrong way. They're meant to stand together side by side and fight that way. Because what's coming against them that makes them think they need an argument this way is not really coming from here. It's coming from there. We, we, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle takes place in the invisible realm. We've got to learn to become more comfortable with the invisible realm because the invisible realm is as real as the natural realm. In fact, it's more real than that. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, you know, we say to each other, write your name in the scripture. <laughs> write your name in this one. God so loved the world. No, no. God so loved Graham. Write your name in this one. Be alert and of sober mind because Graham... You have an enemy, your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Notice what the scripture encourages. Be alert and of sober mind. It's an important instruction because be alert means be awake. I think we sleep in the realm of the spirit. I think there's a call to wake up, to wake up, wake up you who sleep. It's not talking about those who naturally sleep, or, but in the spirit realm, we, we, we slumber. We're not alert the way God wants us to be. Sometimes it takes us a while to realize that what's going on is not natural. It's spiritual. Why does it take us a while? Because we're not awake to the fact of what the enemy's doing. We're not alert to it. We're not, and it says, of sober mind. Well, that just means take this seriously. Take it seriously. Take the spirit realm seriously. I know some of us want to think, well, this is the realm of spiritual giants. This is the realm of funny people that, that go by the name of intercessor. 
Listen, this is the truth. The devil trembles when he sees the weakest Christian on their knees. This is the truth. There's a battle that we're in. We're called to, to, to fight. This, we're meant to stay awake and take seriously this very important reality that we have a very real enemy in the, in the invisible realm that actively engages against our life. He doesn't care that we're in Christ. In fact, that's a target on our head. He doesn't, he doesn't submit to authority. He's a rebel. So he'll go against the boundaries because this is who he is. God is for us, but we have an enemy who is against us. The fight is real. Devour is an interesting word. I mean, devour. It carries a certain sense of ferocity with it, right? I mean, uh, we've got this beautiful dog, Prince, little Shetland sheepdog. He's what, five, five and a half years old. And part of his love language is to play. And, in, and when he's really playful, he just comes and, and he, he, want, he, loves, he loves tug. Play tug with me, you know. And when he's really playful, he just comes up and opens his mouth and puts it over you and just gives a little tug. Doesn't bite down hard. Lions do. Lions don't play tug. They're ferocious. They take huge bites. They, they seek to devour. It, but devour is interesting because it means to drink down. In Psalm 124, we read, when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive. It's, it's, it's telling us there's a fight that's going on in the invisible realm because do you ever feel like you're being swallowed up in difficulties and pressure? Do you have one circumstance that seems to overwhelm everything else in your life? One thing you face that attempts to engulf you. Devour also means to drown. It's a very similar picture. We feel like we're drowning in something. Only if you've ever experienced a moment of being held under the water too long, you will know the added dimension of panic and fear that, you, that sets in as you struggle to try and find the surface. Any surfer that's gone out on a day they probably shouldn't have and caught a wave that was too big for them and lost their board on the way and got held under the water knows exactly what I, uh, you're twirling around like you're in a washing machine. You don't know whether up is that way or that way. You've got no idea and you're losing your breath and you feel like you're drowning and your panic is setting in. Fear is taking hold of you. And the Bible says that's what the enemy tries to do in the invisible realm of our lives. He tries to, he, he, he attempts to breach our life. But you know, Paul writes and says, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. And in that context, he's talking about not holding unforgiveness towards one another. So just, just having relational conflict in the natural attracts something in the spirit. And, and if we go too long in the natural... After a while, that thing in the natural is not just something in the natural. There's an enemy in the spirit that's come and attached itself to that. It talks about we've been trapped by the enemy. We get trapped sometimes through our natural behavior. We get trapped and we don't realize it. We just think it's us. Look, if the us is not like Jesus, it may be just a trap that the enemy has got us uh, into. One of the strategies of the enemy is to lull us into this place of forgetting that we're in a spiritual conflict. We, we forget our need to be sober-minded. We think everything has a natural cause, a, a cause. And when we forget we're in a spiritual conflict, we try to apply natural solutions to what a spiritual problem. And we think, why doesn't anything work? Well, it's not natural. That's why it's not Working, we think the answer to our difficulties is to make some kind of change in the natural. Well, I, I think I probably need to change my job. Well, you'll take you with you. You'll take your issues with you. You'll take where you haven't got victory in your life yet with you. Because you need victory. If you had the victory, maybe you wouldn't need to change the job. I once prayed and said, Lord, can I change jobs? He said, yes, 
but I'll have to teach you the same lessons in the next one. God has his hand on our lives. We think, the, we think maybe I need to change church or change my spouse. People think that. They think the answer to my problems is to change who I'm with, you know, or, or change house. That's the answer. Or we think we need to move to another city or we think we need a sea change. The coast will fix it. Listen, everybody thinks the coast will fix it. We all think the coast would fix it. We'd all love to have a sea change. Well, Ali and I, we've got a sea change in Brisbane. We went and lived out by the bay so we could have our sea change and still stay planted, still fight the battles that we need to fight. I'm preaching all right, eh? Yeah, yeah, I am, you know, because God's trying to get something into our heart today. You know, we can pack up and move, but nothing will change because the problem wasn't natural, it was spiritual. The conflict has its source in a different realm. It's coming from an enemy who is attempting to devour our life and God calls us to take a stand against him. We don't even like to think that way. But God calls us to take a stand against him, to not be moved and to press for the victory of Jesus in our life. Peter went on to say in the next verse, resist him. Speaking of our enemy, our personal enemy, the devil, resist him. Standing firm in the faith. We're called to resist him. We're called to push back. That's what resistance is. Push back. Push back. Push back in the invisible realm. We have to learn to fight with spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 4 in the, in the New Living Translation says this. We are human. It's good to know, right? But we don't wage war with human plans and methods. We use God's mighty weapons, not mere worldly weapons. Notice that we wage war. We wage war. I think that we mostly focus on being defensive against the enemy. We take a defensive stand rather than an offensive stand. We, we, we think about putting on the full armor of God. That's how we think we get through the battle by putting on the full armor of God. It's important to be clothed right in the conflict. We need to be standing in truth and, and righteousness and peace. We need to have the, the, the shield uh, you know, up. We can't let the shield drop down. We've got to stand in faith. We need to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We shouldn't be a pushover. We should stand. We need to stand. And having done all, the Bible says, stand. But we also need to use the weapons given to us by God and press for the victory of Jesus against the works of the enemy. See, I, I don't want to stand clothed but not fight on behalf of those who have been taken captive. Part of what we did this morning was to enter the fray on behalf of others. That's part of what we did. When we raise our hands in prayer for people who don't know Jesus with all these issues in our life, we're saying, I'm going to enter the battle for their soul. That's what we're saying. I'm going to enter the fight. We're not going to say, well, it's not my issue. It is our issue. We're born into a conflict. This is our war. It's our time. It's our day to make a difference. You know, I, I don't want to stand but not enter the fight for prodigals to return to Jesus. That's not an easy fight. I, I don't want to stand but not resist the enemy on behalf of those who are blind and broken and bound and hurting. I've got to learn how to set people free in Jesus' name. I've got to learn how to heal in Jesus' name. I'm a soldier in the army. That's not in my notes. It just sounded good. I don't want to stand but not resist where lives have been breached. And the songs of ascent call us to live higher. It calls us to live higher. We live higher. Higher than where, we're, than where we've been living. Higher than the natural realms we feel so comfortable in. We're called to take a higher place with God. We're called to stand in a higher place of authority than we have been. And pressing for victory requires us to stand in our authority and to exercise our authority. We're going to read some verses from Exodus 17. It's a really great illustration for this. Reading from verse 8. The Amalekites came 
and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of the men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I'll stand on the top of the hill. Tomorrow, I'll take a higher place. I'll take a higher place in the battle. I'll stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, he had that rod in his hand, as long as he held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Moses' hands are up. The children of Israel are starting to prevail against the enemy. He drops his hands, and the enemy starts to prevail against the children of Israel. Who did victory belong to? The enemy or the children of Israel? The, enemy, the victory belonged to them, but did they always have it? Were they always standing in it? Were they always winning the fight? Why? Because they'd lower their hands. When Moses' hands grew tired, and they, they'd lower that rod, and, and they took a, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. We've got to learn to have steady hands in this realm. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. You know, the rod in Moses' hand is a symbol of his God-given authority. Whatever it is, whatever you want to make of it, it's when he was commissioned, uh, God gave him a rod and it represented heaven's authority being exercised on earth. When Jesus sent us into our world, he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth, therefore go. We have that same authority. We ha when, as long as his hands were raised, God's people prevailed over their enemy, but when his hands lowered, the enemy prevailed. It's not a question about whether or not we have authority. We have authority. The question is, are our hands raised or are they lowered? Are our hands raised or are they lowered? Because when we lower our hands in the invisible realm, the enemy gets the upper hand. In the natural, we grow tired. We need other people to stand around us and to help us. But other ways, we just need to not be lulled into thinking we don't have authority and not be lulled into thinking in the spirit realm, and I'll explain it, we shouldn't have our hands raised before God so that we can prevail and win the fight. I want to encourage us to use our weapons, to exercise our authority and fight. So we sing, this is how I fight my battles. It doesn't instruct us a lot. Singing is one way we fight. So it's a good song. It's a great song. Uh, it, it's a true song. But there are other ways. So this is how I think we, we wage war and fight our battles. Firstly, we fight from rest. You know, fighting is not striving. Um, Paul said in Timothy, you know, we fight the good fight of faith. It's faith operates from a place of rest and assurance. Faith's focus is not the enemy. My one fear with bringing a message today is that we start focusing on the enemy. The battle's never won by focusing on the enemy. The battle is won by exercising our God-given authority every day. Because that's what we're meant to do, but we don't always do that. So faith's focus is God, not the enemy. Jesus has won the victory. The grave is empty. He has ascended. All authority in heaven and earth has, be, has been given to Jesus. This is not an equal fight. Don't think of it as an equal fight. The devil isn't equal to Jesus. I'm going to say it again. The devil isn't equal to Jesus. I know it was a mind-blowing revelation a few weeks ago when I said the devil isn't omniscient. He can't read your thoughts, so don't tell him what they are. <laughs> we, somehow we think there are two equal powers in the universe. That's not Christianity. That's not the truth of the Bible. This is not an equal fight. The devil isn't equal to Jesus. Jesus was in the beginning. The devil wasn't. 
there wasn't like in the beginning there was God and the devil. No, in the beginning there was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And all things that were, that were created were created through Him and nothing that exists was created except by Him. In the beginning, there was the Lord Jesus Christ. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He created some angels. One of them rebelled. One of them rebelled against God's authority and God's purpose for their creation and became a fallen angel that we refer to as the devil. This isn't an equal fight. This isn't a fight with an uncertain outcome. The victory has already happened, but as we saw in that illustration, even though victory is our inheritance, we still have to fight for it. We still have to press for it. That's why we pray, let your kingdom come. What's the kingdom? It's a conflict of the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Why do we pray, let your will be done? Because in the invisible realm, the will of God is resisted. We stand in the fight, but then we affirm, you know, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And we declare the amen to that, uh, to his victory. So we fight from the rest of faith. And John tells us this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. But we fight, secondly, with a sword in our mouth. Jesus resisted the enemy in the, I love, I love uh, the opening chapter of the book of Revelation because John has a vision of Jesus that's awesome. And when he describes him, he says, out of his mouth was a two-edged sword. I love the fact that that's where authority and victory is. It's like a two-edged sword coming out of the mouth of, of, of Jesus. You know, when Jesus as human resisted the enemy in the wilderness, he res resisted with the declaration, it is written. He put a sword in his mouth. Paul writes to us in our conflict and takes and instructs us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God needs to be in our heart so it can become a sword in our mouth. We exercise the authority of God in our life by speaking out the Word the Holy Spirit is stirring in our heart. Sometimes it's a very simple thing. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I had an amazing day with Jesus. It really was an amazing day. Uh, I can't go into it, but it was just an amazing day. But for the following two days, uh, it was terrible. It was like I was in a complete funk. I don't, didn't know who I was. Didn't know where Jesus was. After an amazing day, you know, just before that, and I'd lost my joy. People ir irritated me. I was over it. I was heading to the coast. Do you know the feeling? I couldn't work out what had happened. I had to repent. Because all that had happened was, it dawned on me that the enemy had put a wet blanket of condemnation and heaviness on me in the invisible realm. And the reason I repented is I said, Lord, I'm sorry it's taken me two days to recognize what this is about. It's just that we're in a fight. It was an easy fight once I realized what it was. This is an easy fight. This is not a difficult fight. I didn't need to rant and rave to get the victory. You know, uh, no fasting was required. Sometimes it is. But in this case, it wasn't. And, and I, could, I could go from being defeated into victory in a moment just like that once I realized that that's where the fight, that there was a fight. I didn't know there was a fight. I just thought I was a terrible person. It was easy. A simple, get behind me. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was enough. It lifted. It was as simple as that. It's the faith that believes that it's true. You see, get behind me is just acknowledging where the problem is. It's just acknowledging that it's coming from someone in the invisible realm who is standing in front of me trying to oppose my forward movement in Jesus. That's all it is. He doesn't belong in front of me. He belongs behind me. You know, the God of peace will soon, not, will soon put Satan under your feet. He's already under Jesus' feet, but soon, in the battles of life, as we walk forward, he, be, he gets behind. It's under our feet. It's an, it's, I know that speaking out the, the truth sounds simplistic, but in the invisible realm, it's the thrust 
and the parry and the thrust of an invisible sword. That's what it is. And this is why we need the prophetic in our life. 1 Timothy 1 verse 18 says this, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Isn't that amazing? You're in a battle. You need some prophetic insight to fight it well. You need some prophetic promise to fight, to fight it well. You know, some, some battles are longer than others and the struggle is greater. Ali and I have told you about our, our beautiful family and our, and our children. You know, the fight for prodigal children is rarely won quickly. And it's a fight where it's easy to lower your hands. It's a fight where it's so easy to lower your hands. When you start believing for people in your family, sometimes it's so easy to lower your hands. But we're meant to keep our hands raised to, to heaven. You know, and Ali and I fight the battle for our children by remembering and declaring the prophetic purpose and promise from God over their lives. Every one of them in their past has had a prophetic utterance over their life. Every one of them. Our son, when he was dedicated as, as, a, as a baby, he was given a prophetic promise over his life. We remember what those things are. And, and, and Paul in, instructed us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. So in our fight for them, we remember the Word that God has spoken over them in previous times. If you don't remember the prophetic, you'll look in the natural and you'll be so discouraged. But when you remember the prophetic, you're looking beyond the natural. You're looking from heaven towards earth and you're seeing the purposes of God. And you're seeing the heart of God. And that will encourage you in the battle. We don't get, we don't get crazy. We just, we just remember, we declare that those words will come to pass in their lives. You don't need to be weird to be authoritative. You don't need to be weird to fight. But you do need to fight. You know, it, it's, it's a longer fight, but the victory will come. Ali and I talked to one of our visiting preachers uh, one time that came through for men's event, and he had had a terrible battle with his teenage son when he was a senior pastor of a church, and we were just sharing with him, because you look for all the encouragement you can. You look for, how do we keep our hands lifted up in this fight? You know, we're not the only ones that have ever fought this fight or are fighting this fight. And he he's, he's shared a story with Ali and I where he... He would take, he, the Holy Spirit said to him, start taking communion on behalf of your son. So powerful. He said he was on his bed, on his son, he went into his bed's room one night, lay down on it and took communion just at the very time that his teenage son was on a ledge about to jump off a building to commit suicide. And in that moment, God visited him. And he was not ranting and raving, praying, ah! <laughs> he was taking communion. God, I remember your hand over my child. It's a prophetic action. It's, it's powerful. It's, it's a remembrance that their lives belong to Jesus because they, were, they have been purchased in, in His blood, even though right now they're making other choices. But Jesus is the one who said that no one can pluck them out of my hand. Well, I've seen the confession of faith. I've seen the participation in the blood and forgiveness of Jesus. Well, our son has a tattoo. Thank God for tattoos, because it says, Jesus' blood will never fail me. Come on, come on, come on. We take communion, Lord, we remember the tattoo on his arm. Remind him of that tattoo. Make it stand out when he's in the mirror. When he, just let him, let him just see it. I can't, Ali and I can't tell you the, the, the prevailing progress of victory that's happening in all of our kids. It's too long a story. I'm telling you, it's powerful because we're not lowering our hands. We're not lowering our hands before God in this fight. We're not worn out by it. It's a fight of rest. We're not, we're not discouraged by it. There are people that pray. And, and, and so many people just will say, I'm praying for you. Other hands are helping us stay up. It's an amazing thing. But, you know, we remember when we take communion, we remember the grace and forgiveness of Jesus to us in taking it so we can constantly offer them. That same unconditional grace and forgiveness. Because how many know when they're making different choices, they're not acting like Christians. They're not doing things that make you happy. They're doing things that can wreck you. They're like a wrecking ball through your heart if you let it get to you. But, you know, and, and this is what I found. One of the things of the enemy with prodigal children 
when, when, when you don't like what they, and, you, and you get disappointed, you know what? The enemy will try and put a wedge between you and your kids. The enemy will make your heart hard if he can. He'll make you stand in judgment, stand in disappointment, stand in discouragement. He has no right to do that. But if we allow him to, he will. Allie and I take communion because there at the cross, at the foot of the cross, we're equal. We're all equal. We're all equal. It's the same grace. It's the same mercy. It's the same forgiveness. What's been offered to us? We have no right to withhold to others. We have no right to speak out judgment or disappointment. You know what it's like with your kids. They're always asking you for money. Well, part of the love, and I, okay, we love Jesus. How can we help you? What are you going to spend it? I don't want to know. What have you got yourself? What trouble have you got yourself into? Oh, don't tell me. I just got to keep my heart soft. We fight the fight. We fight in the spirit with God's mighty weapons of faith and the word and prayer and the prophetic and with, and with unconditional love. And in the invisible realm, our hands are lifted up. Our hands are lifted up. We're not lowering them down. It's too easy to lower them down. It's a good fight because we get to win if you stay in the fight. It's a good fight because some things are worth fighting for. You fight until you see the victory. You fight until the breakthrough comes. You keep your hands up in the invisible realm so the Spirit of God can prevail on your behalf. I don't know why it happens that way. I just know it does. I know that that's the encouragement of the Bible to us. I'd like the team to come and join me if you could. Because lastly, we fight with a song in our heart. You know, the Psalms of Ascent are songs. Don't sing the blues. Don't sing, don't sing country and western. Arr, life's a pain. <laughs> sing the victory song. Sing the victory song. Sing the victory song. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. That's the victory in this song. Our help, they were going through terrible stuff, but this was the victory. He Praise the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Psalm 9 and verse 10 says, Those who, no, have the team gone and had a cup of tea? Or? <laughs> Antho has this thing with me. He just... I invite him up to the stage and he's out the back having a cup of tea. And uh, I'm left here on my own. <laughs> They're coming to join me. I'd really like it. I'm starting to feel like I'm suicidal here. <laughs> oh, I like that. Psalm um, 9 verse 10 says this. Those who know your name trust in you. Those who know your name, trust in you. This is a song of ascent. We should know the name of Jesus in our life so much better. Day by day, by day, by day, by day. We should know the authority that's in His name. We should know the power that's in His name. We shouldn't be disputing in our heart who He is revealed to us through His name. Those who know your name. The journey, part of the journey of life. It's just to know the name of Jesus in your life more and more and more. Just to know that name, that name, that name of Jesus. Because in that name we sing, in that name we praise, in that name we walk, in that name we trust. We trust in Him, we trust in His victory because we know His name. We know that His name is Jesus. It's the highest name above every other name. It's the name of Jesus, our Savior. He'll save from sin. His name is Emmanuel. God is with us. He's with us in the battle. He's with us in every fight. He's with us in every situation. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. It doesn't matter how we feel. We don't live by how we feel. We live by ascending in faith towards God. We don't live by our feelings. We live by who we know. We know His name. His name is Healer. Man, you fight some battles on, on behalf of people, but we've got to fight them. Sometimes we don't see the victory, and it's hard. We know there's the ultimate victory. 
We know there's the salvation. We know that now in heaven, there's no more sickness, no more pain for those who have passed because they passed through sickness. But we don't lower our hands because we didn't win one. We don't lower our hands and offer. We don't stop offering the healing to the broken, to the physically needy. We don't stop offer, offering healing because Jesus' name is healer. We get through our disappointments, the heartaches and the highlands. We get through those valleys and we keep moving upward with God, trusting with our hands prevail. He's healer. We know His name is deliverer. There's no circumstance or situation where Jesus can't work His deliverance into our lives. Whatever trap the enemy has set, Jesus is the one who sets us free. Whatever chains come across our life, whatever bondages that we get ourselves into, Jesus is our deliverer. We know that His name is baptizer. Wow. We get to live with the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We get to live with the fullness of the Spirit in our life. I, I am totally for grace. Ali and I, lo we love our life. It is a grace-filled, joy-filled, blessing-filled life in so many ways. But where the Bible says to keep on being filled, it's a command to constantly keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Singing psalms, part of it. But you know how that section starts? It starts this way. Be very carefully then how you live. Be very careful then how you live. I want to live my life in freedom and grace before the presence of God in a way that's conducive to maintaining fullness of the Spirit in my life. If there's anything in my life that's displeasing to God, I'll lay it down in an instant so I can stay filled with the Holy Spirit in my life. I don't, want, I don't want the things if I don't have the Spirit. I want to do what pleases Jesus and what, you know, in, in the Bible it talks about the Father, he says, my, it's a prophecy in Isaiah, my soul delights in Him, my soul delights in Jesus. He says, I'll put my Spirit on Him. You know, we can live in such a way that our soul delights the Father. Like, 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 our, like the, the Father's soul is delighted by us. And he says, I'll, I'll just keep putting my spirit on you. We need his spirit. He's the baptizer. We know his name is wonderful. Everything that God has planned for our lives is wonderful. Doesn't matter what situation that we find ourselves in, God can do a wonderful work in it. Jesus has this amazing ability to be a wonder worker in our life. His name is Counselor. His name is Almighty God. You want to stand with me because I'm the only one standing and I'm excited, you know, about the name of Jesus. We know His name is Prince of Peace. He's everlasting Father. Listen, listen, listen to this. He's everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. He'll never not be a father to you. He'll never not be a father to our kids. He'll never not be a father to anybody. He's everlasting Father, everlasting Father. His name is King of Kings. His name is Lord of Lords. His name is the name above every other name. Come on, we lift up our 